have two speakers who will be talking about the health and safety concerns for personal cannabis cultivation as proposed by the Cannabis Act 2017. Oh, yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. So our first speaker is Lila Steiner. Uh, an environmental health and knowledge translation scientist at the National Collaborating Center for Environmental Health. She has a background in chemical management, science policy, and regulatory frameworks for emerging contaminants. At the NCCEH, Lila is the lead on the cannabis and EH file and has focused on the risks, communication, and personal cultivation. She is also currently a Bridge Fellow at the University of British Columbia. Her research, recent research has included work on endocrine disrupting compounds, food contact materials, and the science policy interface. So let's hear from Lila. Thanks very much, Men. Um, so today I'm going to talk about growing at home and focus on the health and safety concerns for personal cannabis cultivation. Before we get going, I want to give you a little bit of background into the organization uh, that I work for. Um, firstly, to talk about all the National Collaborating Centers for Public Health. In 2005, the Public Health Agency of Canada um, created these centers to promote the use of knowledge and evidence by public health practitioners and policymakers in Canada. Uh, there are six of us. One of, a, one of them focuses on methods and tools, Aboriginal health, infectious diseases, healthy public policy, determinants of health, uh, and us, the Environmental Health National Collaborating Center. Our mandate is basically to synthesize and exchange knowledge. We wanna find uh, the best science out there and put it into packages that are useful for different public health professionals. We identify the gaps in knowledge so that we can spur new research in these areas. And we also wanna connect people who are working on different kinds of projects. Our audiences are um, medical health officers, environmental health officers, public health inspectors and other environmental health practitioners across the country. So we are a national organization. I mean, I do have to state up front that neither the NCCEH or myself have any interest in the cannabis industry. We just want to get that out of the way right up front um, because a lot of people do have questions about that, um, especially when I cross the border these days. So just keep that in mind as we go forward. It's definitely about uh, getting all the evidence together on what we, we have seen so far about personal cultivation. So the, rate, the way that this project got started was actually because there were a number of high uh, profile media coverage uh, instances of some cannabis related explosions um, and several fire departments actually contacted the NCCH uh, looking for information related to the types of hazards that might be encountered in fighting these types of fires. Um, this led us to put together a couple of different framing questions and look at the bigger picture here. So the first framing question is what environmental health hazards are actually associated with cannabis cultivation processing or use? How is legalization going to affect the extent, scale, and conditions under which cannabis is cultivated, both commercially and in personal settings? And what measures uh, and considerations uh, should we take into account to reduce exposures through all of these phases? So the scope of this presentation today is actually gonna talk about five key areas of risk that are spread throughout the production process. Access and accidental poisoning, indoor air quality, which I'm going to emphasize a little bit because I'm um, talking mostly to people who are related to air quality and, and BC lung in general, uh, pesticides and pesticide use in the home, electrical and fire hazards, and radiation hazards. As we go along, I'm also going to talk about some policy considerations that are relevant to each of these risks so that we can think about how we might be able to design some proactive interventions. Um, once we've gone over these risks, I'm going to switch gears a tiny bit just to talk about risk communication at the end um, in the context of cannabis and cannabis processing. Um, before I start on that, if you do have any interest in learning about the health effects of cannabis and cannabinoids, there's an excellent uh, report that came out from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. They use a great strength of evidence approach. Um, and so I, I would recommend that everybody who is interested in looking at that part of this uh, conversation go check out this document. Um, we have listed it on our cannabis topic page on our website, um, along with a whole bunch of other resources if you're interested in any other aspect of cannabis. But this is definitely the go-to report if you want to look directly at health effects. So to give a little bit of context, right now we have commercial operations in Canada and they're in a medium to large scale. There are 67 active licenses for medical growers. Uh, and what's important to note about these is that they are subject to inspection and sporadic testing. It's not consistent, um, but that's something that occurs, which is not likely to occur for any personal cultivation. 
Under the proposed law, which will be will come into effect next Wednesday, um, each household will be allowed to grow up to four budding plants. So that's four mature cannabis plants, and you can see them here in this picture is about the scale of what each of those plants looks like. It is going to be extremely difficult to regulate people keeping within the four plant guideline, um, and so the likelihood of overproduction is quite high, um, and enforcing that act is going to be very problematic. Um, more context here is that there isn't any guidance right now on how to do this. There's not really anybody out there who's providing uh, key points or risk messaging about how to process and grow and dispose safely. Um, so that's going to be an issue going forward when people start to accumulate these plants in their home and they don't really have anybody out there telling them how to do it properly. There's also uh, good evidence to suggest that illegal grow ups are not going away. That hasn't actually changed the number or the legalization in the states that have legalized hasn't changed the number of illegal grow ups at all. Um, so we don't wanna go into this thinking that that's going to really reduce criminal activity. It's just going to provide another outlet for people to have access to this product. So let's talk about the first environmental health risk from home cultivation. That's access and accidental poisoning. Under the act, there's not actually going to be an in-home possession limit. So you're actually able to accumulate large quantities of cannabis and cannabis products and waste and plant material in your home. So this does increase the risk of inadvertent consumption, um, both by adults, children, pets, um, both adults who are aware and unaware, there's just gonna be a lot of access to it. So we actually have to look at poison control data to get a sense of poisonings and access or poisoning and access issues. And so far we have a ton of great data, both from Canada and the States. And the data in uh, the States actually gives us um, a whole bunch of information about how children are, are poisoned uh, more, more than uh, adults generally. So one good study actually identified that children are just as likely to consume waste products such as an unfinished joint or plant material or things like what's on the slide right now um, which is hashish, if anybody didn't know that. It does look a lot like chocolate, so I think you can all imagine why a child might be likely to put that in their mouth. Um, so it's it's very reasonable to think that uh, there would be just as many instances of, of poisonings from those types of products. Um, the other reason is because adults tend to be very diligent about edibles. They tend to put their cookies and their, their brownies in a cupboard on a high shelf in a locked container, whereas they're not quite as diligent about a joint because they assume that no child or pet is going to eat that which has not actually been the case from the data that we've seen coming out of the poison control centers in the States. This is Kellen. He ate an entire cannabis cookie three days after this paper was published. One cannabis cookie is usually between four and six doses um, for an adult. So one dose for a 25 pound dog is actually enormous. It's usually quite fatal to animals. Don't worry, this he survived, he's fine. Um, this is my dog. This is the embarrassing part about this, is that <laughs> this came out through, this happened three days after this paper was published, and actually he went to a friend's house, she took him overnight to go hiking the next day, her roommate left a cookie on the coffee table and she took a shower. He obviously eats everything he can find that's edible, so he ate the cookie, the wrapper, the bag that it was in, and they didn't notice that that had been eaten until eight hours later. So animals, children alike, they are curious, they're gonna go out of their way to find these things and you might not even notice until it's much, much later in the day after you might be able to call the poison control center and get any information about it. Don't worry, he was just mellow. He turned out fine, he has an iron stomach. <laughs> but a lot of dogs would not have experienced it that way. Okay, so some policy considerations for access and poisoning. We do wanna promote safe practices for cannabis plants, products and waste in the home and that means encouraging people to use lock boxes, encouraging people to have locks on the rooms where they're growing. Um, we want people to have labels on the things that they have in their home so that people, so adults who might not be aware will also not have these issues. We do wanna support poison control centers because they have been an invaluable source of information, not only for the public, but also for emergency services. Um, doctors and nurse, nurses in emergency rooms um, do often call the poison control center because they're not necessarily accustomed to seeing cannabis intoxication. Surveillance for cannabis poisonings is going to be essential as well because we do want to have similar data to the kind of data that we get in the states right now. Um, and that might be something like suggesting that they need to report cannabis intoxications the same way that opioids, opioid overdoses need to be reported. So if emergency rooms now have that kind of re requirement, then we might get a little bit more information about um, where the poisonings are occurring. Finally, we also want to make provisions for waste disposal. And by that, I mean, when you grow it in the home, you end up having a lot of leaf and plant material and 
you might not know what to do with it so that it doesn't end up just in your organic bin out front um, that anybody can go into and, and take plant material out of. Uh, Health Canada currently has provisions for medical uh, cannabis and what they recommend doing is blending it up with some cat litter and water and then putting it in your organic bin. Um, unfortunately, that's not actually going to be in line with bylaws that are uh, relevant to every municipality. So there are going to be there are going to have to be municipal decisions made about how this kind of waste is going to be processed um, and knowing how to put that waste out on the street or take it to a facility is going to be uh, essential to not having huge piles of it um, accumulate in somebody's home. So let's turn to indoor air quality, uh, which I know is of uh, greater interest to this group. Um, some context here, cannabis is a humid plant. It is a humid plant in the first place because it needs a lot of humidity to establish itself. You need upwards of 70% humidity just for the roots to become strong enough to keep growing. Once the mature uh, plants grow to their full size, they actually produce upwards of 70% humidity. So the equivalent is thinking of one giant mature cannabis plant as producing seven tropical plants worth of humidity in your home. Um, because there's a plant limit of four, that means the equivalent of 28 tropical plants in your home. Most people also won't spread these plants out among their different rooms in their home. They'll have that all happening in one room where they grow. Um, in commercial facilities, you can see here in the space what amount of mold and humidity creates when you have that kind of plant material in one small space. They do tend to seal the room because they keep that humidity and it helps the plants grow. And it also controls odors. So sealing properties is another way that we can have humidity and mold issues uh, accumulate. This is especially problemat problematic in Canada uh, because most homes are winterized pretty severely and there is not a lot of ventilation in those spaces. Um, so in climates where it's much, much colder, this is likely to be a bigger problem. Um, and as I, as I noted, even just a few plants can increase the moisture burden in a home. So the second issue with indoor air quality is the odor. Uh, odors do come from a complex mixture of volatile compounds, um, hundreds of volatile compounds, in fact, and they're produced alongside the odorless cannabinoids and the resinous secretions of the flower. Um, the odors do increase with flowering and may intensify during the drying and curing process. But there actually is no evidence at this point to suggest that cannabis odors are detrimental to human health. There's an excellent evidence review that was published by Public Health Ontario uh, in the spring, uh, May, June sometime, that, that focuses just on cannabis odors. So if you're interested in finding out a little bit about that, um, I recommend that you go check it out. And once again, it is posted on our cannabis uh, topic page. Um, however, it can be argued, and they mention this in their document, that odor it itself does impact well-being through annoyance and disruption and stress. Um, but beyond that, there's no health effects that we've uh, been able to find thus far. Um, the third issue with indoor air quality is carbon monoxide. So CO is a hazardous byproduct of propane or natural gas powered carbon dioxide generators or burners, um, which are sometimes used to enhance plant growth and increase yield. Um, we've also found that ignition devices can create an explosion hazard if there's a fire due to the presence of compressed gas. And other hazards uh, and hazardous practices include venting furnaces or water heaters directly into your home um, to increase the CO2 because that actually helps promote plant growth. Um, so you can see how all of these things combined uh, creates quite a high risk of having carbon monoxide levels higher than they should be in a grow space. So some policy considerations for indoor air quality. We do definitely want to limit plant numbers. Um, because impacts on indoor air quality do scale up with the number of plants, low plants, low plant limits should minimize the risk for home growers. But because, as I mentioned, these are going to be impossible to enforce and overgrowth is considered quite likely if you've invested the time and energy into getting all of the materials that you need, um, limits alone aren't actually going to mitigate any of the indoor air quality risks. They're just going to help a little bit. Um, second, we can avoid a lot of these humidity and mold issues by growing outside of the home. Uh, several provinces have indicated that they're going to permit outdoor or open air growing on private property, and I think the Yukon is one of them at this point. Um, although this does increase the risk of theft and may exacerbate odor complaints, so many other provinces are balancing uh, the risk of these indoor issues with the risk of those outdoor issues, like having people aware that plants are being grown in your yard and having access to the plants from passerbys and what have you. I have a question. Yeah. Plants actually that much older outside of your neighbors' No, I don't know. So if, if people didn't hear that on the phone, uh, there was a question in the room about whether four plants would actually produce enough odor for a neighbor to notice outside. outside. Right. 
Um, and I think that's dependent on a couple of different conditions. So climate is one of those conditions, depending on the weather and the temperature and the humidity and the cold and all that, that's going to make a difference. Um, it's also going to depend on the strain and the hybrid and what have you, the type of plant. So um, actually in the odor paper, uh, PHO identifies the fact that they're subjectively very different odors depending on what kind of plant you're growing. Um, and some might find them pleasing and some might not find them pleasing. So it's one of those things where if it's right up against their fence beside their tomato plant, they might smell it. Um, if it's in a back shed in a non-attached structure, they might not smell it. Um, it's very variable. And so I think that's why many provinces have said, no, we don't want to even open that can of worms um, and have opted to just accept the indoor risks versus keeping those plants outside. So unfortunately, it's not consistent. How do the plants get to the future? Uh, well, the plants get to human size. So so my, I'm five, six, like most mature plants, you can see in this photo here, they start out as buds. This is like little seedlings on the side and they'll grow up to corn stalk size um, as a mature plant. So with, if a, a whole field of cannabis plants would look like a whole field of corn. Um, so they're large plants. They're, they're significant if you had them in your home. Um, and obviously it depends on how good a gardener you are. Like they're not all going to become huge plants, if, but in the right conditions, they certainly will. Yeah, go ahead. So one of the questions in the room was how long does it take for the plants to grow? And again, this is dependent on how good a gardener you are. So are you pumping CO2 into the room? Do you have the appropriate lights? Um, is there enough moisture? It re it's so dependent on the conditions and whether you've given them the right conditions. So it's not like a normal house plant with crops and seeds in it. No, just I mean, I, I don't know how lucky you are with your normal house plants, but <laughs> they're, they don't, they're not all successful. <laughs> Some of them are very easy to grow. I've planted a zucchini plant in the backyard yeah. and like that just expands like a weed and mint yeah. you can never get rid of. I think it's pretty variable depending on how much effort you put into it um, and whether the conditions are right. You know, I, I think that's what it comes down to. And so will your neighbors notice it by smell? If you've got a lot of them, probably. Um, if they're right beside it, definitely. Um, but it's so variable depending on how well the plant grows and the conditions that it's under. Yeah. Oh, wait. I'm sorry. My third point on the slide here is to consider the use of indoor air cleaners. Um, however, I do want to qualify that with saying that air filtration units are typically pretty limited in their uh, ability to capture mold spores. Um, and to date, there haven't actually been any formal evaluations of the efficacy of portable air filtration units or air cleaners in the context of indoor cannabis cultivation. So that's kind of a buyer beware at this point. Um, some growers are recommending it, some are using it in commercial spaces, but there isn't anything to suggest uh, that they're going to be as efficient as you need them to be. And finally, and perhaps most obviously, we really do want to discourage the use of ignition devices indoors. Um, however, because gas-powered CO2 generators are available for sale in Canada and are also used outside of the home in perfectly legitimate like locations like greenhouses, which is something that's quite common, um, banning the sale of those devices might actually be incredibly challenging. Uh, Sacramento County did ban the use of CO2 generators in indoor grow spaces, but it's completely unclear how this ban is going to be enforced. There's no mechanism in their ban to figure out how they're actually going to deal with this. What about like a furnace that, you know, is an yeah. ignition device? Absolutely. Like a water heater is also an ignition Exactly. Device. Like the, be yeah. Helpful. So just can, can somebody in the chat make sure that the questions are being, can you hear those questions in the room? Can you just respond? And then the person who's moderating the questions will be able to tell. Um, but the question in the room is just like we, we obviously can't ban furnaces, no. right? Um, it's a problem, right? It's a real it's problem because people, as well as water yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Water heaters are another thing and people are venting those devices into the room because it's, it's a source that already exists in your home. Like right. why not put a little tube up and take advantage of that, that CO2 that's being produced? So absolutely, I think it's very difficult to think about enforcing that kind of thing. They can't hear? Okay, they can just hear me. So I'm gonna repeat every question in the room if that's okay. Okay, so let's turn now to our third environmental health risk. Um, as with all other types of gardeners, cannabis cultivators do have to deal with common insects, such as spiders, mites, aphids, attacking their plants. Um, and these, of course, aren't health risk themselves, but any pesticides sprayed on the plants to control them may very well be a health risk. So there are a couple of key issues with pesticides and pest management. The first is that cultivation conditions, like the ones I described earlier, lots of plants in a small space, lots of humidity, um, they're confined, everything is sealed in, uh, does make cannabis susceptible to pests because mold or blight can quickly wipe out an entire crop. And as a result, there's a strong financial incentive to use potent options to make sure that that doesn't happen because it's a very, very quick uh, timeline between something showing up and something destroying all of your plants. 
Um, the second issue, which is specific to the United States, but I do want to mention is that cannabis is federally still prohibited in the United States, which means that federal regulatory agencies like the FDA and the EPA and the USDA, they are not getting involved in this at all. So for example, there are no EPA registered pesticides for cannabis in the US, which means that those formal risk assessments are just not getting done. And there's no guidance on what might actually be appropriate to use on cannabis plants. We can't use pesticides here in Vancouver. So what would people use them for? Like, what Use um, so the question in the room is that, or is to mention that in Vancouver, pesticides are illegal to use. Um, in your, are you referring to your, your lawn, home? On your lawn. On your lawn. I mean, yeah. You can't buy pesticides except natural products. So what would you use as a pesticide? Gro if you wanted to use one. What kind of products would you use as a pesticide if you wanted to use them because they're not easily accessible? Um, I'm going to just turn the slide now quickly so you can we can take a look at this, and I'll answer it right at the end of the slide. Um, so in Canada, pesticides are regulated by Health Canada and the Pest Management Regulatory Agency. Um, and there are 20, 20 pesticides registered for use on medicinal cannabis, but they are not synthetics as you're pointing out with your question. They're a mix of oils, salts, detergents, biologicals. The overuse of these pesticides generally doesn't have a ton of harm associated with it. So even if you overuse it a little bit, um, you're not likely to have too many adverse effects. Um, however, there is still a strong incentive to find those synthetics on the market, and they are available to commercial operations, to agricultural farms. So actually getting a handle on them is not as difficult as you might think, because going to a nursery or like a large scale commercial nursery um, is very easy in terms of purchasing those products. Um, and they're, they're products that are, are they are um, encouraged for use on different types of plants. So this is something, so an example of this might be that um, a synthetic chemical that's recommended for use on strawberries. Um, people might say, oh, it's for something I eat, it's fine. I'll be able to use it on my cannabis plant. But as I'm sure you know, when you inhale a pesticide, it's different from consuming it. Um, so the fact that those pesticides that are approved for use on consumables um, don't have any guidance out there for whether they should be used on cannabis is a little bit of a problem. So people are just going to reach for the thing that they think is going to do the most the most good for their plant, or not most good for their plant, but the worst to those pests, right? Um, so it's actually quite easy to find other chemicals that have nothing to do with can cannabis that people are going to just assume are going to be fine for their cannabis plants. Sounds risky. It does sound risky. It Sorry, the question risky. in the room is that it sounds it risky. Sounds risky. Yeah, it all, all sounds risky. risky. <laughs> yeah. So some uh, considerations for uh, pesticide use is once again growing outside. Um, as with indoor air quality issues, moving the grow outdoors or to a secure non-attached structure on the property would reduce the risk of children, pets, or adults coming into product into contact with the pesticide product. If you've got anything in your shed, it's better than having it in your den, in your home. People are going to have less access to just the contact with the chemicals in general. Um, but again, that's not necessarily on the table for everybody because the provinces are not allowing that kind of growing. Uh, second, we do need to identify and promote low-risk products. Um, regulators in Canada and the U.S. have taken aggressive action to eliminate the use of high-risk products, so including guidance, inspections, testing, recalls, and fines on different products, as you mentioned, that um, are not allowed or have gone through all sorts of um, terrible press, uh, and so there is a lot of regulation around that kind of thing, um, but there haven't been any efforts to identify products that might be appropriate for home growers. And that's part and parcel of the fact that it hasn't yet been legalized. So it's very difficult for anybody to come out with a certified okay pesticide um, when it's not a legal thing to go to you to do yet. Um, at the minimum, though, products that have been approved for commercial growers, uh, they should be reevaluated for home use because they have there are some that might not be appropriate in a smaller setting. Um, the public is likely to continue to utilize dangerous products that are intended for use on other crops unless there's guidance that tells them otherwise. Uh, third, it is uh, important to develop cannabis specific guidance and target that to growers. So being able to make sure that you reach the audiences that are most interested in this is important. Um, maybe putting this information into the youth education campaigns is not as important because growing is not going to be as big a thing. You want the impaired driving pro uh, education campaigns to reach the people who you think will be the target audience there. So just being very aware that these education campaigns have to be uh, given to the right audience is, is really important here. Okay, our next environmental health risk, electrical and fire hazards. Uh, these risks are often linked to inappropriate or improperly installed equipment, 
um, and the presence of combustible materials and illegal cannabis processing. So here you've got a situation where you've got a lot of different things going on. Um, high wattage grow lamps produce enough heat to cause serious burns. They also draw large amounts of power that increase the risk of shocks and overloads, which can lead to fires. Um, some homeowner, homeowners are gonna exacerbate these risks, similarly to how they exacerbate CO by venting their furnaces. Um, they do tend to install large circuit breakers to avoid power interruptions or by messing with the home's wiring intentionally to provide power to that grow space. Uh, other fire hazards include the presence of fertilizers, compressed gas for that CO2 generation that I mentioned earlier, um, and the presence of a lot of dried plant material, not great for fire hazards overall. This goes back to what I was mentioning right at the beginning, which is why the fire departments contacted us, um, because if there is a fire, these items can increase the risk of explosion uh, and may even decrease the time to escape. So because of these and other physical and structural hazards, home grows are considered to be much more risky to first responders than typical residential fires, and presumably also to the occupants uh, in need of rescue. A second component of the electrical and fire hazard story is illegal cannabis processing. Uh, this is a very hazardous process and poses additional risks of fire burns and explosions, but under the proposed acts, individuals are going to be allowed to process cannabis in the home uh, with some limitations. So just as a little bit of context here, although some cannabis concentrates can be produced in a whole bunch of different ways, uh, extraction using butane or other organic solvents uh, is of particular concern when we talk about electrical and fire risks. The process actually involves blasting, like literally blasting a pressurized organic solvent through an open-ended tube or column packed with cannabis, collecting the liquid that flows from the bottom and then purging the solvent using a heat source to get that golden hash oil that you see at the top of the screen there. Um, despite these pretty intense risks, uh, it is still pretty appealing for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is that it has incredibly high potency. So many of these concentrates um, and these oils uh, in, have a THC content of 60 to 90%, um, which is incredibly high. Second, it can be produced incredibly cheaply. Um, so we can make, get these, these uh, concentrates through the waste products. You don't have to use the buds. You can use the buds to actually smoke or consume in some other way. But all the leaves and trimmings, you can turn into a concentrate. So if you've put the effort in to actually grow these enormous plants in your, in your home or your yard, um, you might be more likely to produce these concentrates because why would you throw away that plant material that could be used to get something for yourself out of it? Um, the raw material will then be more available after legalization. And so uh, it is likely that serious burn uh, injuries may increase. Just some data in terms of the states that have had uh, issues with this. There have been a growing number of explosions since legalization, um, over 100 burns and three deaths um, in the last couple of years. In Ontario, there have been 30 hash oil related incidents uh, in the last five years. Um, and in BC, there's a suggestion that 36 hash oil related incidents uh, have taken place since 2012. Um, there is an interest in increasing, uh, or there's an increasing interest in producing this kind of a, a substance. So um, it's certainly on the radar as one of the bigger risks because of the magnitude of the problem. Um, unlike the other risks that I mentioned, those are all kind of chronic issues such as mold and pesticides, but something like an explosion has gotten a lot of media attention. So what can we do to reduce some of these risks? First, we can attempt to regulate equipment the same way um, that I talked about regulating those generators and those burners, but again, it's gonna be incredibly difficult. We can't restrict people from buying butane. I have canisters of butane in my home for camping. I mean, that's something that's just on every store shelf and you can get at every Canadian tire. So it's gonna be something um, very, very tricky to keep control of. Um, we can use municipal building electrical and fire codes or federal legislation to um, regulate the installation of intense hydro hydroponic, high wattage hydroponic systems. Um, again, people can use them for other purposes though. So it's a lot of labor. It's a lot of um, money to do that kind of enforcement. And uh, I don't think anybody knows how effective it's really going to be. Um, we can encourage the risk, the use of lower risk equipment. For example, we can use LED lighting systems um, to reduce energy uses and heat output to, to bring down some of those fire risks. And LED lamps have been shown to produce just as high quality plants as some of the high heat plants. So that's something to consider. Um, and regarding hash oil production in particular, uh, legalizing home grows without a provision for how people might try to process the material will definitely increase the risk of exp ex explosion. So um, interventions aimed at reducing these should consider a couple of different factors. Uh, one is the availability of raw material. 
two, the severity of legal consequences, and three, access to legally produced regulated commercial concentrates. So uh, what I mean by that in the second case is the severity of legal consequences. Um, Colorado and California, because they've had so many problems with the explosions, have actually put a fine of $900,000 and rising if you are found to be processing uh, hash oil illegally. Um, so the disincentive to doing it is actually uh, quite large because they're trying to control this problem that they had not foreseen. Um, regarding the third, Washington state has taken an alternative approach and they've just legalized access to those concentrates. Under our proposed act, concentrates will not be legal initially. Um, so it's something to consider because if people have access to this and it's inexpensive compared to the process of having butane and solvents and like high heat processing in your kitchen, um, it's certainly something that most people will avoid. And actually Washington state has not had any explosions as a result of having this policy in place. Um, unfortunately, this is not to say that there aren't risks to having concentrates for such a high concentration of THC. So it is still a potentially a very high, highly hazardous product in terms of consumption. Um, so that's kind of what's being balanced, the risk of people doing it themselves at home or the risk of poisonings from these really highly concentrated products. Um, finally, just in general, we need to promote less hazardous methods. Um, explosion risk and exposure to residual solvents can be reduced by promoting non-organic solvent-based extraction processes, either at home or in commercial operations where this has been a similar issue. So let's turn to our last environmental health risk, which is radiation. Grow lamps, uh, as I'm sure you all know, are often used to intentionally produce high-intensity UV light uh, to either increase THC content um, or to control fungal spores in the air or on surfaces. Uh, UVC is used to control those fungal spores and UVA or B is used to, incre and is used to increase THC content. Uh, it is incredibly easy to access UV equipment uh, because again, people use them in greenhouses and I have friends who use them for orchid cultivation. So it's not at all something that's difficult to acquire, um, but it does mean that growers can tamper with their UV bulbs um, and remove the filters from those bulbs to increase the UVC output so that their THC and mold uh, control and fungal spore control is a bit higher. Um, these practices do increase the risk of UV-related skin damage and eye damage, depending on the amount of time they're used and how long people are exposed, um, and whether or not they're using any personal protective equipment when they're in a grow space. Uh, several studies have identified increased health risks from exposure to UV in commercial grow ups, uh, including one that found that working for eight hours in the nursery would cause a worker to exceed the threshold value for UV by about ninefold. Um, so just to keep in mind, eight hours, ninefold the amount of UV you're supposed to be exposed to, and you certainly are not just spending one day in your grow space. So that's just something to think about with regard to radiation. Here I've included a picture uh, of a worker in a commercial facility tending to plants. He's got on some long sleeves, he's got a hairnet on, some sunglasses. All of these are great things, uh, but his neck and head are unprotected. Uh, and notably, the hairnet and sleeves are actually to prevent the resinous sticking flower from being contaminated with human hair. So they're not at all to protect the worker, they're to protect the cannabis um, from impurities going forward because a hairnet does not protect you from any kind of radiation or pesticide exposure or mold or fungal spores, as I'm sure you all know. So some policy considerations for radiation hazards. Um, as I mentioned, UV emitting lamps are widely and commercially available. Uh, for a variety of useful applications, including drinking water treatment, air purification, they're, they're used all over the place for all sorts of important things. Um, the products do vary in quality and they may or may not be certified for a particular use, but at the moment, really all we can do um, is to encourage consumers to read and obey the manufacturer's recommendations on safe use of, of UV emitting products. Uh, to our knowledge, though, there is uh, the potential risks of UV emitting devices have not actually been addressed in other jurisdictions outside of occupational settings. So we have seen a lot of evidence on worker exposure, but no, nothing has really been done about exposure in the home. So now that I've been through all of those environmental health risks, uh, I want to turn quickly to public risk messaging. Uh, because legalization in Canada is still evolving, and as you know, we're only eight days away right now, and decisions are still kind of changing every day, um, interventions are still limited, and we do thus need a proactive and focused risk messaging approach to address some of these environmental health risks to growing at home. Um, as I mentioned throughout the policy consideration section, enforcement is going to be challenging even after these regulations and guidelines have been developed, which makes education campaigns and public discourse about this even more important. Uh, in the paper that we wrote, which kind of 
discusses all of the things that I've talked about today, but in much more detail. Um, we've developed a table with recommended public risk messaging related to each of the five environmental health risks uh, that I talked about. I know it's not necessarily, it's going to be a bit too small for everybody to read on the screen here, um, and I don't want to dwell on them in any detail, but I will focus specifically on the next slide here um, on the indoor air quality risk messages that we put together. Um, so the first risk message that we want to discuss uh, for indoor air quality is that we do want to pay attention to the scale. Um, so home growers should scale their production according to the ventilation capacity of their home, um, the sensitivity to mold of the occupants of the home, so the presence of asthmatics, for instance, um, and their ability to actually control odor and, and see how in order to affect people's annoyance and, and disturbance. Um, second, we want to control humidity. Uh, by assessing and reducing moisture sources, uh, restricting cultivation to a humidity controlled room um, and using hum uh, dehumidifiers as required will kind of help to deal with some of those humidity issues. Um, monitoring relative humidity using a, a hygrometer is also another really important thing and it's a really cheap thing to do as well. Those, those monitors are available all over the place. Um, we do want to be vigilant for signs of dampness or mold and consult professionals as needed. There is a hope that because of legalization, there will be less stigma around growing so that people are going to be more likely to reach out, uh, not just to people for mold and dampness, but for things like installing electrical related equipment. Um, and so they are more likely to talk to contractors and try to do things themselves. Um, we do want to encourage people to dispose of mold infested plants safely and quickly because as I mentioned, those that kind of thing spreads very, very fast, especially in small spaces. Um, so we have to have provisions in place and guidance in place uh, to help people uh, figure out how they want to get rid of their plants and, and how they can do it as quickly as possible. Um, as I mentioned in the, the section on indoor air quality, we do want to consider non-ignition methods of CO2 uh, enrichment to reduce some of those um, risks for carbon monoxide. And with that is we should be equipping all homes with a CO detector if they are interested in growing. So there are some challenges to this kind of risk messaging. Um, we sit on the, and when I say we, sorry, the National Collaborating Centers Center sits on the Federal Provincial Territorial Work Working Group on Cannabis Communication. And part of that role is to develop and discuss cannabis communication strategies. Uh, the work also focuses on identifying challenges and crafting these messages uh, in a consistent way across the country, across different health jurisdictions um, and with different public health professionals at the helm. Um, some things we want to keep in mind when developing these messages is first, how can we adequately and fairly inform the users uh, of the risks to themselves and to others? Uh, second, how can our messages actually reduce harms to those who choose to use? We're not trying to, stig uh, to use stigma here at all. We actually want people to just be a little safer in their practices. Um, and how can we not rely on stereotypes and fear in this process? Because we don't want people to actually have an overwhelming fear of something that may just be a minor risk. Uh, much of this work has actually grown out of risk communication that is used in emergency situations like floods and wildfires. Um, and the main tenet of this approach um, is actually to be first, be right, and be credible. So we want to get those messages across in plain, simple language. We, we want to make sure the target is right for the audience and that the message is right for that audience. And so when we're talking about home growing, we want to provide risk messages to adults about indoor air quality. We may want direct communications about CO detectors to neighborhood groups rather than during education campaigns targeted at youth uh, about managing harms from consumption. So um, using all of those strategies is going to help get this message across in, in a non-fear based way. At the same time, we do want to understand the limits of the evidence that we have such so far. Um, our knowledge of, of cannabis risk is incomplete. Uh, legalization is greatly going to facilitate uh, research on this subject, but at the moment, all of our information is from states that have legalized because we can't actually do research on cannabis in Canada, and certainly we can't use our public health dollars to do that uh, until it's a legalized product, so that's definitely something to consider. Uh, in public health, there is still a bit of an accusation of reefer hysteria, so we don't want to go out there and overblow these risks or, or overblow the risks of consumption. It's why that paper that I mentioned earlier about the health risks of cannabis and cannabinoids is so important. We do really have to have a realistic idea of um, the problems that we potentially face uh, and what problems are a little bit overblown. We should stick to what we clearly know. There are four things that we clearly know in the evidence. One is that inhaling particulates and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons is bad. Regardless of what you're smoking, um, it's unrelated to the drug. It's about those uh, particulates. 
Careless use and storage can lead to child pet poisoning and to unaware adult poisoning as in addition. Um, and that's something that's, that's non-debatable here. Driving while impaired is dangerous. We can say that, we can give that message clearly. Um, and then there are smart and not smart ways to grow cannabis at home. There are definitely ways that we can reduce our risks and definitely uh, things that we would do that would make risk way, way higher. So what can we do overall? Just some takeaway messages from this uh, talk. The magnitude and duration of the risk that I talked about is really going to depend on how many people choose to grow at home, how big those grows get, and how many people actually stick with it. This is a really, really important feature when we talk about this because I think a lot of people think, well, it's overblown. Nobody's going to actually do this in their home. It's just a couple of plants. It's not going to be a big deal. And that may be true. It may just be my parents who put one plant beside their raspberry canes in the backyard and they chuckle to themselves and they're like, this is just amazing. We have a cannabis plant. That's, that maybe is not going to be like the situation or maybe it is going to be the situation. The point is that we don't know. We have to have health surveillance in place. We have to encourage poison control uh, centers to collect that kind of data. We want to encourage people to call those poison control centers. Um, so until we have a good sense of the scale, the extent and the persistence, we don't really know if these risks are going to be overblown or if they're completely reasonable because people don't know how to garden effectively inside their house. Knowledge translation is going to be super important, um, which is what our organization does. It's to, it's to get all that science together and to put it into a format that people can actually digest, that public health professionals can actually digest in addition to the public. Um, and through that information, we can incentivize some safe practices. One of those things that's been considered uh, are things like cannabis safety kits. Maybe it's something that Home Depot sells. Maybe it's something that you can pick up at City Hall, but a little kit that has labels in it for all cannabis products that has locks for your doors that includes a CO detector and a humidity detector. Maybe it's something as simple as that to say, here are some tips for if you're gonna grow at home, these are some safe ways to do it and minimize the risk to yourself and to your family. That's something really simple that could be put together. And uh, it's definitely been proposed at different municipal levels um, to help people just get aware of what they're getting into. I also wanna mention that we can leverage the interest that is, in, that is uh, on cannabis right now for these other public health risks that are in the home already. So I just mentioned putting carbon monoxide and humidity detectors in a cannabis safety kit, but frankly, they should be in every home regardless of the fact that you're growing cannabis. So if somebody is interested in cannabis, maybe we can get them to install these things in their home. Maybe we can get them to pay attention to their electrical supply and to other fire hazards. This is actually a great opportunity for people um, to mitigate some of the things that we're already dealing with in the public health, health system. Um, so we do kind of have to jump on it uh, while the attention is hot um, to get people to pay attention to these risks. Um, next, I, I just want to close quickly by saying that our next project is uh, going to hopefully deal with edibles in 2019 and some of the uh, environmental health risks um, that has to do with processing and uh, food safety risks that come along with that. So that's where we're going in our, uh, in our projects going forward. I've included some references here on the slides uh, that you can all take a look at um, once the slides are posted. Um, and as I mentioned, there's a cannabis topic page on our website that has a whole bunch of different resources, depending on what you're interested in. If you do want to read the whole paper, Growing at Home, uh, Health and Safety Concerns for Personal Cannabis Cultivation, I've put a very shortened link here so that you can write it down quickly. It's not a super, it's like a 15 to 20 page document with lots of images and um, all these key risk messages that I mentioned. Um, so do feel free to write that down. I've also put my email. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. I can connect you to anybody else who's working on these projects. Um, and thank you so much for having me here today. I'm happy to take questions for as long as we've got left. And uh, I think uh, my colleague is actually gonna speak about some other cannabis issues related to smoking. Um, so if you have questions about that, feel free to go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so I have one question that's come up here. Actually, maybe I'll scroll to the top. Oh, no. Uh, here's the first one. Are there actually any studies that assess potential impact of odors from cannabis? I think the PHO report actually said they couldn't find any studies that showed any evidence either way. Yeah, so that PHO report um, was meant to be an evidence review. It wasn't a study in itself. It was meant to put those reports together and there was you're right there was absolutely nothing that showed uh harms from odor exposure um but there were certainly none that showed no harms of odor exposure it's that there were no findings either way so you're completely right uh next question uh is there any effluent generated from planting cannabis how is it characterized so when you say effluent i, I hate to ask you to clarify your question do you mean runoff from watering cannabis that has pesticides in it um, and if so 
I would say that there certainly is effluent generated if you're growing at a large commercial scale. Um, the amount of runoff that you would have growing cannabis in a pot is limited to the pot. Um, so it's not, I, 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 so if you can clarify that, that's what I would, I would hypothesize. Um, it certainly is an issue in commercial operations. And I think if anybody has driven down to Richmond recently or um, in Southwestern Ontario, there are huge commercial facilities already set up um, and the pesticide uh, in runoff is certainly going to be an issue for that. I don't know if it will be an issue in a home grow situation, um, but I, I would consider it a real risk in a, in a commercial setting. Okay, uh, could pesticides that are safely used on tobacco plants be potentially used on cannabis plants? Tobacco is grown to be burned and inhaled. Yeah, so that's definitely something um, to consider. And I think the issue is not that those pesticides don't exist, is that they haven't been um, certified for use on cannabis yet because cannabis is not legal. So yes, that's absolutely an approach that would help. Uh, the problem is just that they don't, they aren't labeled as such at this point. So people aren't reaching for them. They're reaching for things um, that, they could put on their vegetables and other things that they could consume. Um, it's also not often that people grow tobacco um, in the same scale in a home setting. People like not many people will grow a single tobacco plant, so they might not consider using those pesticides on cannabis as well because they want to use their plant for a variety of different um, production processes. Uh, but that's absolutely something that's uh, relevant. So thank you for that question for sure. I think that that's something that needs to happen. That's okay. I think that's all the questions we have. Okay. We have oh yeah. Here. Do we have any questions from the room? from the room? No. Okay. Well, no. that's great. So we've got a couple of minutes now for Anne Marie to, okay. to talk. Thank yeah. you so much. Thanks, Lila. Uh, our next speaker is Anne Marie. She is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Health and Sciences at SFU. Her areas of research include knowledge translation, occupational and environmental health, and risk assessment. Anne Marie works also in uh, work also includes exploring novel ways to communicate information to the public, including the use of popular culture as a vehicle for creating and disseminating risk messages. Anne-Marie. Thank you, Matt, and I hope everyone can hear me. Um, and I'm sorry I don't have any slides, and I thought I today, and this is in part because the uh, I'm also working at the NCCEH in conjunction with Leela keeping abreast of what the policy changes are around cannabis. And as of today, there was yet even more changes. So I've put a link on the notes section just so that people can see some of the updated information. For example, about a month ago, there was regulations around the consumption of cannabis on boats. And since then, it's now been uh, with some consultation cannabis is allowed to be consumed on a boat if it is anchored. The same with a vehicle, there is new regulations for RVs. So there's been no cannabis smoking allowed in a vehicle, except if it's an RV and you're camped in a campground. So just overall to say that if you are working in the area of where cannabis can and cannot be consumed in British Columbia, uh, this provides the most recent update, but it generally follows what's allowed for tobacco use, although there are some interesting additions. In particular, one is the use of, of hotel rooms. So for tourists, there will be the ability to smoke in a hotel room if the hotel allows it. So that would be something that would be discussed, like I guess, on making an accommodation as to whether or not you could consume within a hotel room. You are not allowed to consume in very specific public places, but you, uh, such as how many six meters from a bus stop, near schools, um, or in hospitals, unless you're in designated smoking areas. But you can consume cannabis on a sidewalk. Now that's what the provincial regulations are. Although each municipality is given the ability to restrict that even further. So right now they're looking to certain municipalities such as Richmond, we know are gonna have much more stringent controls, particularly on retail. So they may follow through with more stringent bylaws. So one thing to keep in mind is that cannabis will not be allowed in workplaces, consumption, it will not, and this is for smoking or vaping, it will not be allowed in um, anywhere near schools, hospitals, childcare facilities, libraries, bus stops, or any workplace. So anything that is both a workplace and a public space, um, and this includes prisons. There's some interesting controversy as to where and how prisoners may be able to consume cannabis. And I don't have an answer for people for that, recognizing that there's both federally and um, provincially regulated facilities of that nature. 
So, so to date, with the exception of a few different things, the cannabis, both vaping and smoking, are following the smoking and vaping regulations for tobacco. Uh, there are differentiations in fines, though. If you are caught smoking cannabis, it's about a $250 fine in an incorrect spot, whereas vaping is only a $58 fine. So that's just one of the only differences I've found so far in the bylaws around uh, consumption. Uh, so I have put the link here for people if they're interested to follow up um, because it does have, again, the most up-to-date as of this morning information on the where, when, and how you can consume cannabis. One thing I did want to add just before I go, because I know we don't have a lot of time, is that for people who are looking to grow cannabis, at this moment in time, the only place you'll be able to access the seed is through the Liquor Control Board's outlets and you may have to order them online because to date um, there again will only be one store that's regulated in Kamloops to legally sell cannabis uh, and right now that's a bit of an issue for people because it's difficult to grow from seed traditionally people grow from clones which are clippings from other plants but the liquor control board has decided that it's too hard for them to essentially go into the nursery business so they're only selling seed stock at this point in time um, and that can have, anyone who's ever grown a plant from seed, you know, you know, it can be very difficult and require the purchase of multiple seeds because they can get moldy very quickly and die. And I have no information, unfortunately, on what the prices or the strains that will be available for those seeds. So I'm just going to stop there. Uh, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask. I might not be able to answer them all, but I, I have read through the recent updates, so I might be able to orient you to which part of the policy you might want to go look at. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Anne Marie. And I believe there is one more question or two more questions from the audience. So the first question is: Are there any existing public education materials that provide guidance for safe growing at home from the U.S. states where cannabis is legal? Uh, question mark uh, Health Canada, CMHC, etc. Um, and no, not in Canada because it's not legal yet. So I suppose our document is as close as it gets to tips on growing at home, uh, but that's certainly not was it what it was written for. It was certainly meant to be a review of the risks rather than a how-to. Um, there may be things for commercial growers, but not for home growers that we've been able to find. Uh, another question is, your upcoming research on edibles is going to address home preparation, question um, mark. And I would really like it to address home preparation um, because that's definitely the Thing that we are most concerned about um, but at the same time the issues with commercial grow ops uh, getting into the food business is a little bit tricky too because um, as much as people might be great at gardening that does not mean they know anything about food safety um, so because they can make a lot of money on edibles um, they might just try to do this in the side kitchen that's beside their huge commercial facility for growing um, and that does not have a lot of food safety components to it. Um, so food safety is definitely going to be the angle uh, and we'll try to incorporate a little bit of both, but that project is just getting started because um, if you, if nobody was aware, the legalization of edibles for sale is going to be within the next year after this first stage of legalization. And I'd like to just add edibles is probably going to include potables, so drinks that contain cannabis as well, which are becoming very popular in the United States. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like Labatt's or Budweiser maybe mm -hmm. just announced their intention to add a cannabis infused beer product. Right. Um, yes. so there's And Coca-Cola as well. So there's obviously a whole can of worms there that uh, we're gonna uh, investigate too. There's one more. There's still one more, oh, sorry. I think there might be one more, but I can't find it. Hold on a second. Is it the very end? Okay. Uh, is there going to be any health and safety information for stratas and property managers? Um, that's a great question um, and certainly something that's still up in the air. Um, there are a lot of questions about whether or not you're going to be able to grow in a rental property versus in a property that you own. Um, and then if you own a condo, um, will you be able to grow in that if there are strata regulations? Um, that's something that's going to be incredibly variable depending on the municipal bylaws, depending on the actual strata bylaws. Um, it's certainly not something that's across the board. I mean, there are provinces right off the bat that have said no growing, period, uh, in a personal setting, and that's Manitoba and Quebec, I think, so far, and possibly one other. Um, one so the territories, one of the... Oh, other. yeah, the territories, um, whereas the Yukon has decided you can grow at home and you can grow outside. So it's incredibly variable. Um, I would say 
to consult your municipal guidelines um, and consult the strata of your actual condo building um, because it's going to change pretty dramatically based on what individual units want to do. There also is a stipulation specifically in British Columbia that if you can see the plant in your house from a public place, so from the so you cannot grow on a windowsill, for example, in a in a rental apartment, you can't put your plant on a windowsill because it cannot be seen publicly. So yeah. or so any sort of space where and whether or not your neighbor is considered public or not is probably going to be debated, but it can't be seen from the street. So you can't show it off in a window where to where it would, for example, get natural light. I think there's also going to be quite a legal debate um, and possibly challenges to the, the, the legalization coming down. Um, when people say it's been legalized federally, how can you prohibit me provincially from growing this? Um, so I suspect that the lawyers are all lined up and ready to go um, for next Wednesday because there are certainly going to be challenges to that in these different jurisdictions.